welcome to Technically Speaking from EBR's EdTech team. We invite you to join us on this podcast to talk techie with us. Welcome back to Technically Speaking from EBR's EdTech team. We invite you to join us every month on this podcast to talk techie with us. We are your hosts, Brittany Davenport. And I'm Nikki, aka Techie Nikki. All right, as usual, we're going to start off each show with a little tech tea to keep you in the know of all the trending news in tech. Hey, Miss Davenport, I'm excited about us being back and I'm excited for Tech Tea. What's our Tech Tea this month? The word on the streets is that EBR has started an esports league. Have you heard about that? Oh, yes, I've been hearing the buzz. Good, because we have a very special guest for our Tech Tea. I'm going to turn it over to her and let her introduce herself and let her tell us all about this esports buzz. Yay! Hi guys, my name is Katherine McGregor and I am part of the Department of Technology Services IT team and I am working with the esports team to bring esports to all of our K through 12 sites. I've been a teacher in EBR for 18 years and I have always loved working with technology so this was just a fit that I saw the passion behind students interests and wanted to make sure that we were doing whatever we could to keep kids loving learning. All right, so let's get right into it. So Ms. McGregor, if a school does not know, could you just give them a brief description of what is actually eSports? Yeah, so eSports stands for electronic sports. I like to tell students that it's competitive video gaming with multiplayer teams and spectators. So I like to liken it to the NFL. It's not just about the players, but it's about all of the people that support the entire franchise or the entire league and allow so many different groups to support with video and audio production, everyone from the cheerleaders to the fans in the stands. And so electronic video gaming usually involves either one versus one play, um, but a lot of our games that we provide with for students is three versus three, maybe five versus five. So we're talking about small teams that are working using the skills that they've already developed. And now we're giving it the scholastic spin and helping them come up with the ways that they can use their skills in video gaming to provide their future career or workforce um, credentials and certifications. Awesome. So I heard you say that it's one-on-one are a team right yes okay so So, how many people do you need for a team well right now we're recommending eight okay eight gives the team enough players to be able to scrimmage against each other but also it allows for space on the team for some of the creative efforts that we know our students are not all gamers but we do know that in these days especially post-covid where students really got into the virtual world of learning and living, um, we know that that's where their strengths lie, or we at least know that that's what they're interested in and that's what they are surrounded by with their peers. So we believe it's really important to get ahead of that. Instead of just giving them free reign, we give them something that's a little more structured that helps in their future, that they can connect with new friends and new groups because it is so fully inclusive. In fact, a lot of people um, tend to think that it needs to be something only done in high schools. Well, part of our program and our league, the EBR Esports League, E-B-R-E-L, is it's all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade and moving on to college and careers to participate and use those skills as they communicate, collaborate, as they come up with creative solutions to problems and work alongside their peers in STEM pathways. So I have another question. So if schools are interested now, I know it's late. What is the latest date that they could actually sign up if they're they listen to the podcast and like, oh my God, I want to do that. What's the latest date that they could possibly sign up to join? 
Well, we spent a lot of time last school year trying to reach out to schools. We went to a lot of campuses, uh, 13 to be exact, and did road shows to show students what esports was about and really to show administrators and teachers. And we got a lot of feedback. We got a lot of interest. So to be honest, we're full for the fall. However, we're not going to turn around a, any turn away any team that is already organized and would like to participate at some level. So if mm -hmm. any teams that are not already currently signed up, and I can tell you we've got nine teams right now from Northeast High School, Estroma High School, Terra High School, Scotlandville mm -hmm. High School, Southeast Middle, Capital Middle, Jefferson Terrace Academy, the Dufrock School, and Villa Del Rey in our fall league. However, we got six more teams ready to jump on and they've already started organizing so they can join us in the spring. And then moving forward with at least 15 to 20 teams, it's our ideal to grow and continue to allow students at every location in our school system the opportunity to join our league. Okay. That's awesome. So what it, steps would a school have to take if they were interested? So we know we sure. have those nine now and then six more coming. What would a new school have to do? So the first thing we like to ask them to do is contact our department. They can email us directly at esports at ebrschools.org. And we can get a meeting set up between our team and the administrative team on that campus and possibly some interested teachers or interested parents. Parent liaisons are another avenue that we're trying to include in our efforts because we really want to build a community. So if schools are interested, we're gonna work with you. We're gonna find you where you are and help you move forward. I know funding is something that really is one of the bigger topics of our initial meeting. And so in order for schools to get started, you can't just use a Chromebook. Unfortunately, you can use gaming systems like a Switch or an Xbox or PlayStation, but those things are not gonna be allowed on our network. So what we need to do to keep students safe, to keep our network secure, is we need to have an avenue for them to appropriately access games, um, different sites from streaming like Twitch and Discord, and need to give them the support they need, but also keep our students secure during instructional hours and after school activities. Um, so it's really important for them to contact us. But like I said, Although we're pretty full right now, we are definitely accepting teams for the spring and moving forward. And we want to do whatever we can to get something started. Um, at Flame, they don't have some of the equipment because it can be rather expensive and it takes some time to build it up. So they're going to start just shoutcasting using a program called We Video that we are supplying to all of our esports teams and everyone in this school system currently has the ability to sign in for a full premium account until December of this year. So if any schools are interested, we start the scholastic side of things because we've really already got the gamers. We need to teach the students how to use those skills they use in gaming to increase their achievement in the classroom. All right. So so I know you kind of touched on it. So the schools are responsible for funding esports. They would have to have the available funds. Uh, could you tell us about the uh, average cost that they would need if they were interested in starting? Yeah. So one of the things they're really going to need besides being router is mm -hmm. gaming devices, whether it's a gaming laptop or a gaming desktop. They need to have a device that's going to be able to put them on a level playing field with other teams. But when it comes to the school level, we want to provide students with that opportunity because these are not tools that you find in a home. They're pretty expensive. And I'm going to say that it costs right about $1,800 to get a pretty um, easy to use and high functioning gaming uh, desktop or laptop. Okay. So, right around that area. However, when you come to vendors in our school system and get packages put together, which is what we do as well from our department, there are other ways to kind of package things and get a discount, but the discounts are very limited right now because of the things I mentioned before. So what we have found is schools that have the capacity, maybe through a PTA, a PTO, maybe you have teachers who are proficient in grant writing, donors choose, and I'm going to give complete credit to Jeffrey Harrison in our department, who's the director of the network. 
he's worked really hard with vendors who have benefited from the size of our school system. And we're finding those vendors want to see those successful cutting edge programs in our schools too. And so they're helping us with some of those. So I can tell you that some of our labs at different schools are vendor donated. And for example, one of the labs right now that we consider the platinum package, it contains seven devices, which allows three players to play against three other players and one host computer. And on that host computer, you have the spectator version of what the audience sees, not what the players see on their screen as they're focused on their own actions and their team's actions. So you need at least seven to run an event. And so that's about $20,000 when it comes down to all of the components from the tables to the wiring, the router, the switches that are needed, the flat screen TV that you're gonna need to show the host screen for the spectator portion. Um, and a lot of different uh, cables and cords, to be honest with you, just a lot of little parts that added together make the full package. Okay, okay. awesome. So what's the minimum age? Um, I heard elementary schools and I heard some high schools and middle schools. So what's the actual minimum age? Can kindergartners play? Absolutely. There is no minimum age. <laughs> That's one of the things about esports. It's fully inclusive. And I can tell you, I have watched kindergarten kids going into kindergarten and it is not as easy, but there's a level of scaffolding. Well, thank you. This is great information. I think this information will get schools started to thinking if they actually want to even get the process started, do they even have the funds and what grade levels they can take. It's, so it's great information. Thank you for coming to our podcast today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And hey, EBR, let's play. All right, you guys, for our main topic of today, we're going to talk about our five ed tech tools that we want you guys to try out this semester. So listen up and give it a try and let us know what you think of them. Our first one is Kahoot. This is a class favorite. All of the students love it. The teachers love it. And of course, it's a gaming platform. Our kids are gamers. They love to play games. So of course, it's going to bring that engagement, that fun to your classroom. And there's a variety of ways you can use it. I know, Ms. Davenport, you said you use Kahoot for what in your classroom? So I used to use it a lot for test prep. Um, I would get put all my questions in, get the students ready, whatever my topic was for the week, and just put those into a Kahoot game like, I mean, um, atmosphere for my students that would just increase their participation, their engagement and motivation. So they were learning without really knowing that they were learning. Mm -hmm. And that could be a quick exit ticket. Uh, if you wanna do a quick check to see, make sure the students learned what you taught that day. That's a quick uh, way to use Kahoot or just for some fun. It's just a variety of different ways you can use it. And what I love about it, there is a lot of Kahoots already created that you can actually go on and utilize for yourself with your kids. All right, and you can also send it home now for homework. So if students have devices at home, you can send that as like a little bonus, like um, complete this Kahoot and we'll come back in class, I'll give you bonus points. So. And is what's great about it is the kids can pull it up. If I know they, most kids may not have a device at home, that's fine. They can use their parent's cell phone and pull it up and do the complete the Kahoot. So I like that. All right, or their cell phone. You know all the kids have cell phones. <laughs> All right, so our next one that we want you to try is Nearpod, and more specifically, Nearpod Time to Climb. So just like Kahoot, Nearpod is that game-like activity, and we know that, you know, sometimes you have to take a break from games, but if you want to pull in that engagement with your students, you have to incorporate some type of game that's going to pull level up your engagement in your classrooms while still assessing those students' understanding. So, Nikki, have you used Time to Climb with Nearpot? Yeah, so the kids love it. They love to race up that mountain. <laughs> um, and, you know, kids are competitive. Even adults, when we're doing our professional development, we throw in a Time to Climb. They're very competitive. So, of course, you want to, the kids want to see their name at the top. So, I think it's a great way to do bell ringers, exit tickets, reviews. As we said for Kahoot, the same thing you would use it. And you'll find it. Time to Climb is very similar to Kahoot. So check it out. It's another class favorites that the students actually like and adults like it as well. Yes. 
All right, the next tool we want you to check out is Flip. And if you did not know, Flip used to be called Flipgrid, but it is now Flip. How ironic is that? Right. So it's the same product that you guys have seen and used and loved, but they just improved some features in it and they've changed the logo. So it does look a little different. And of course, it's still for your classroom. You can use it at home. So this is another so if you want to assign it, if the students have devices, because we have to be mindful of assigning things and our students don't have devices or access, the, the proper access at home for right. it. So what are some ways that you can use Flipgrid with your uh, students in the past, Ms. Davenport? So I used, I loved Flipgrid just because it gave all of my students um, voice. So, you know, some students are not going to raise their hand and they're not going to participate in class. But for some reason, when you pull up Flipgrid or Flip, <laughs> <laughs> it makes all the students want to talk so they have the um the privacy of talking just to their computer so they don't have to worry about am I saying the right thing they can go back and re-record it and make it perfect for them so that they can go ahead and share their voice and their answers to you and to their classmates so I loved flip just for that um aspect and I like that it gives the teachers the opportunity to hear, like you said, every student's voice, because, of course, when you're in a classroom, a lot of the kids will raise their hand, but you don't have time to actually listen to each one of them share right. out their answer. So as a teacher, it does give you the time to go back and listen to each one of your students to make sure they have a conceptual understanding of whatever it is that you're teaching and you have that evidence there so you can go back and listen to it and provide the, the proper support to the students. So I love that feature. All right. And if you check it out now, they have some new features and some new things in their camera. So go ahead, check out flip.com. It used to be Flipgrid, but make sure you go to check out flip.com and tell us if you really like to use Flip in your classroom. All right, the next thing we want you to check out, it has not been released yet, but stay tuned. In Google Classroom, you will have access to practice sets. Ooh. And as teachers, we love things that are already set and ready to go. Right. So with the practice sets, it'll be interactive and engaging. We know we have to engage and make things interactive for our kids. Otherwise, we're not going to keep them. So with the practice sets, they'll be able to uh, go in and do practice review activities depending on what the skill is and there's things that are that are already created by the system and then teachers can also create their own items of course we like to have that flexibility to create our own but also we want things that are already created as well and we want you guys to stay tuned for that in google classroom and if you go to our link in our blog you'll see a link where you can preview what the practice practice sets will look like and how they can be used and it'll be released soon you'll see that option soon in google classroom we're so excited for that because i think that'll be very useful as we know we are in this testing age where it's test 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 so we can start early making sure we're practicing and, and reinforcing skills so that our students are prepared for the assessments at the end of the school year right all right, and our last but not least is an oldie but goodie classroom screen. And I think you taught me about this years ago, Nikki. Um, mm -hmm, years but, ago. <laughs> but it is still <laughs> very useful, very beneficial. So classroomscreen.com, go to that. You can use that as your whiteboard. You can insert um, different backgrounds, polls. Uh, what else do they have on classroom the screen? The traffic light. I like the traffic oh, yeah. light, especially One of my when favorites. I'm doing the small groups. And I have that on the board so that they can monitor their noise level. I like that. But you make sure you have a it connected to a computer or a PC with a mic on it, a built-in microphone. All right. And they also have that the timer, the built-in timer. So you don't have mm -hmm. to go to YouTube and try to find a timer. It's all right there. And it can all be placed on one screen so your students have everything at one glance like I could just look up and see their sound level they can see the traffic light they can see what we're working on in class also and they can also see that timer and it used to be totally free but of course you know <laughs> after the pandemic everybody got a little greedy so but it's still for what you need it for it's still basically free but if you want to upgrade to the premium you can but why just use the right. premium version <laughs> and you'll be fine right so that pretty much wraps up all five of our um, top 
it take two to try out this semester make sure you try out at least one or try out all five and let us know if um if it works for you in your classroom let us know what's your feedback or do you have another ed tech tool that we missed that you would like us to feature on our show see you next time